Good morning and welcome to Behind the Screen. I am JM, your GM. This is Behind the Screen where we just sit around and we talk about games. Game design, game reviews, looking at fantasy genres. We're taking a break from our current look at fantasy genres for the day. We just wrapped up our Sword and Sorcery uh, overview and we're going to do Grimdark starting on Thursday. But I figured today would be a good time to do a review. We haven't done one in a while. And I picked up a book at Gen Con and this was my big... Uh, find at Gen Con, if you will, sort of the the diamond in the rough. I picked up a lot of other books, books I've been excited about, books that I have pre-ordered, but this was a book I did not know was coming out, and it really surprised me and really captured my imagination. So, as you know, I'm a big fan of Zweihander, big fan of D100 games in general. Zweihander, I think, is quite possibly the best and most coherent D100 rule set, especially in the vein of Warhammer Fantasy. Hey, Rook, good to see you this morning. John said good morning to you in the chat. Let me say good morning to you here. And before we start, happy birthday to uh, several of the cast members of the FET5. This is their birthday week. Last Thursday was Restars, or Ben, as you may know him. He is our brother Block character in the FET5, and uh, today is Kit, Jenny, who plays Kit's birthday, so happy birthday to both of them. Just wishing you uh, many more, and thank you so much for being a part of our crew. So, this is a new campaign that came out for Zweihander, The Eternal Night of Lockwood. Now, first of all, I mean, the book is gorgeous. It's got their matte cover, it's got some nice spot treatment even on the side. You can see there's a little bit of a metallic sheen to both the Zweihander logo. Silver lettering for the Eternal Night of Lockwood. I don't know if you guys can catch it, but there are... Uh, the eyes on this NPC on the cover have spot treatments of metallics on the eyes. So it really pops. It's 370 pages, uh, includes a map and a ton of great handouts that are... The perforation on these are... Uh, spectacular. I don't know if you've ever had that issue that I have where you are trying to get handouts or maps out of the back of a book and the perforation is awful and you end up tearing the map or you end up tearing the book. Not a problem with the Eternal Night of Lockwood. Good morning, Ian. Good to, good to see you here. So, the Eternal Night of Lockwood. What is it? It's a campaign for Zweihander and really any good dark fantasy or horror game. And it is set in the town of Ertol, which is a, a mining and lumber town. And five days ago, the sun didn't rise. This darkness settled over the town and its environs, and everyone is trapped. Water flows through the river. Water can pass through, but nothing else can. The whole town is starting to go a little crazy as this mysterious darkness has settled over the town. Now, I don't want to give away too many spoilers because this is this is a review for a campaign that's not even out yet. I believe we'll put the link uh, to pre-order it in the show notes. I believe it is for sale. It'll, it'll go out in October. This was a one of several advanced copies they had at Gen Con for sale, which was awesome. But what you get is ten, a 10-act 10 adventure, you get a number of seeds for side quests, and you get a fully fleshed out town to set your campaign in for uh, Zweihander. It's got a deep mystery, ancient druidic orders, strange demons, uh, and but still, right, D100 games, they speak a lot more to the personal nature of these quests. So you are members of this town. You are stuck here. These are the people that you're, you've grown up with, that you've worked with, that are slowly going mad as something is starting to infect the town. Rage is starting to possess them. So it's not a save the world. It's literally just save your, your home. You get a ton of great NPCs, and I love the format, and I'll be completely honest, I'm totally biased to the format of these adventures, because it's the same format that I used in Fall of the Children of Bronze for Jackals. You get your adventure synopsis, you get the important NPCs, but most importantly, it gives you the themes of the adventure. And we're talking about you know, 
the 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 main story themes that the adventures are written about. So, for example, uh, chapter six, Silver Gutters. Uh, Rainy Day floods the streets with coins, and the lucky those lucky enough to grab up the wealth suddenly die in tragic and mysterious accidents. Most impoverished folk in Airtol whisper that the coins are cursed, but if you investigate, you learn that there's a sinister group murdering to take back what's theirs. The quest themes here is the idea that deals with the crushing oppression of poverty. The total value of coins that emerge from the sewers are only a day's expenses for the aristocrats, aristocracy, but potentially life-changing for the dregs residents. So this is the, the poorest part of town gets flooded with these coins. And it's not a lot, but it's enough to change their lives. And so each of the ten campaigns has this campaign theme that allows a GM to get in the mindset and see how it all ties together. Now these are not just high-minded, hey we're going to talk about this thing here in the themes. And No, every part of the adventure ties back to that theme and they tie in cohesively. There is a, a bit of a contrivance on how you get from one adventure to the next. I'm not saying it's a bad contrivance. Uh, there is, at the end of each adventure, you are delivered a rhyme through various and sometimes supernatural means that gives you a hint of the next part of the quest. Now, there is an in-game reason for this, and uh, poetically speaking, the rhymes are, are quite uh, interesting. It does help provide some structure for the 10 art campaign, or the 10 adventure campaign. You don't need to use... You, you can lean as heavily or as lightly into that contrivance as you want. I actually think that Story-wise, they do a good job of explaining, hey, here's why this is important. And at the end of it, you are given a very weighty moral choice. And again, this is something that I love. If you read through Fall of the Children of Bronze, this is the, the choice in that game was, do we work with the Beasts of Chaos in order to destroy our enemies? Or do are we called to do something greater? Is it the short-term or the long-term game? And I think they do a good job of setting up an interesting moral choice and hopefully providing the PCs with enough weight on both sides that it's a tough decision for them. Now, uh, oh, sorry to hear that, Padre. Hopefully, uh, leave a comment in the YouTube channel. I'd love to chat with you about this one. Now, when I say an equally weighty choice, I, uh, let's go back to the original Civil War arc in Marvel Comics. You are presented with these two sides as if they have evil weight, but it's almost as if the writers don't really agree with the Tony Stark side of the Superhuman Registra Registration Act, and all of the good weight of the argument is left on Captain America's side. So I read through Civil War multiple times, and it never felt like an, a true equal choice. It seemed very clearly that Cap was on the, in the right, Tony was in the wrong, much of the fallout of the events could be laid squarely at Tony's feet. But in this one, you are seeing, as you are trying to save the town, you are actually seeing the town at its worst. You are seeing the violence, the greed, the debauchery, the anger, the vengeance that these people are taking because they don't know if they'll ever get out of here. And so when you're given the choice to help or the town or save yourself there's there's a weight there because you've seen the town at its worst do these people deserve saving and again right Zweihander will talk a lot about this in the Grimdark series that's coming up because Zweihander is sort of a good example exemplar of Grimdark role-playing the moral choice is there because you're not playing the bright shiny heroes of an, an f20 fantasy game you're playing the grim and gritty heroes of a Zweihander campaign. So you're, the selfishness has more weight in a game like that. Ian and I have been talking a lot about this in um, some of the projects we're working on. Grim, gritty, grim, dark, that sort of thing. You can try... No, so when the choice comes in, the choice is very pointed help the chaos now at the expense of the town and save yourselves or risk yourselves and your souls to save everyone else 
So yes, uh, John, it is 10 adventures. It is a, again, 370 pages. This is actually like a solid, I'm not going to throw shade at other companies. That's not who I am. I feel like you can get a solid set of campaign enjoyment out of this book. It will be... I would actually argue that some of the adventures are probably one session adventures, John, and some of them are two to three sessions depending on your players, especially how they handle mysteries. So you're probably looking at somewhere between 10 and 20 adventures or 10 and 20 sessions worth of adventures and then with the side quests you could probably extend that to about 30. Uh, it's a $55 book Ian. Uh, again it's got kind of the standard treatment of Zweihander books uh, all sepia tones black uh, text on white background with kind of the the headers set out in a sepia tone. It's very clean, very easy to read. Not a lot of color throughout the book, which is fine. It adds to the grim and grittiness of the campaign. Uh, the handouts are uh, given spot color treatments. They look great. And again, you can just pull out the perforation, cut out the handouts, and you're ready to go. So again, for $55, I feel like this might be one of the best campaigns that I have read recently self-contained campaign in recent memory now granted i love the horror at headstone hill that box set has given us a ton of enjoyment this is sort of along that line it's a very localized campaign it's a little bit less sandboxy than the horror at headstone hill it is a it has much more of a through line as a game master they give you a lot of hooks to kind of expand that out you get a massive amount of npcs you get a town that it, if I were running it, I might even start the campaign two or three weeks before the Eternal Night Falls. Let the players do some explorations, set them in the town, set them up to care about these people, and then watch it all go to hell. So, Ian, not a lot of color in the book. So, again, uh, it's either it's a white page with black text or the sidebars are black with white text. Again, only the headers give you any sort of color differentiation. And it's it's almost, it's like a brownish red uh, for the headers and the NPCs. So yeah, it's, it, but what I like about it is it adds to, again, kind of that grim feeling as you're reading through it. Phantom, good to see you, sir. Uh, the map is also full color, Ian. Uh, the map is beautiful of the town and its environs so again just a quick little review talk about the eternal night of lockwood again things that i like about it is they structured a lot of their campaign in the same way i structured follow the children of bronze not saying there's any correlation between the two just the fact that i liked reading through it because it's laid out the same way i lay out my adventures again it is very npc focused it's a good mystery that you're trying to solve over a long arc. And even though it's a grim and perilous world, you get these spots of, of magic. There is a uh, trying to discover a set of glyphs and what those glyphs mean and using a magic item to reveal the glyphs as you move through the campaign is a key plot point to this campaign. And so, again, I would say that if you like Grim and Perilous role-playing, if you like Warhammer Fantasy, if you're a fan of Zweihander, or if you just want a great setting to adapt to whatever game you're running, I would definitely check this out. So Lockwood's designer was, and I'm going to butcher his name, unfortunately, I hope I don't, James Intracasso, who has written for 5th uh, edition, as well as, I believe, uh, MCDM, this is, this is, he was the designer on this adventure. And it shows, it is a well thought out, well put together, very robust set of adventures. And again, for 10 to 30, uh, I got a little schmutza on my book. 10 to 30 sessions for 55 bucks, less than $5 a, uh, an adventure once you get down to it. And again, 
if you save the town, you have a whole town to launch new campaigns on going forward. <laughs> I wasn't going to butcher James, John. I was going to butcher his last name. Ah, excellent, Padre. Glad that you are still here. So, yes, uh, Grim and Perilous Roleplaying. I am a huge fan. We're going to talk a lot about Zweihander over the next three behind the screens as we get into Grim Dark Fantasy, which is a very unusual genre of fantasy, something that we see a lot more of. We're going to talk about a little where that came from, why the response, what's going on in the zeitgeist that has caused the response of Grim Dark Fantasy to be on the rise. But yes, so that brings us to an end, at least of the review of The Eternal Night of Lockwood. I'm sure they're going to put a PDF out on Drive-Thru RPG. When they do, we'll update the show notes. But for right now, you can pre-order it, uh, I believe, on Amazon. I'll put the link in the show notes. And it releases, if I remember correctly, in October. So last night we had our episode 10 of the horror at Headstone Hill. We only have two episodes left. We got to see regular combat, we got to see quick encounters, and we got to see how duels work in Deadlands. It was a great episode. Wickers was on point the whole night, uh, tearing his way through all who stood in his way. Ada got to, to duel with the man who uh, killed her husband. Leslie got some great screen time uh, with a gargoyle version of himself. And Sister May was just a ray of sunshine. So if you haven't checked that out, you can go over to YouTube. It is live on there. we got two episodes left. And then we are going to uh, do a post-mortem. And then hopefully we'll jump right into a Rifts, Savage Rifts 1 or 2 shot. Padre, I don't know how much the digital is going to be. If I can find that, I will put that in the show notes. Unfortunately, I don't know that off the top of my head. And tonight on... The Iconic Production Channel, we are starting the brand new arc, uh, the Diamond Armament. It's a, a new Torg Eternity arc that we're setting in uh, the Nile Empire side of Istanbul. Sure to be fun. Come and join us. Yes, Ian, I agree. There is... RPGs are woefully underpriced and undervalued in the fact that if I buy a role-playing game... Or $60. Say I buy the Zweihander core rulebook. Or the Blackbird's core rulebook. Because I can't wait to show that off and do an unboxing on behind the screen for it. For $75. $75. I could run Blackbird's for the rest of my life. And get 3-6 to six hours a week of enjoyment out of it for myself and my friends. Never having to buy something else. Just run through it. Whereas, sure, you could get... Three movies for that price. Maybe four movies for that price. But once those 8 to 12 hours are done, you have the memory, but you basically would have to buy it again to see it again. There is nothing quite like role-playing games in the in the world. Yes, John, I also agree. I mean, we're, we could talk about this for a while. I think sort of... Again, we were talking about this before the Savage Worlds game last night, about the whole 1D&D and the virtual tabletop and everything that they're doing. I think there's some intelligent marketing behind 1D&D. I have personal issues with sort of what I see the potential fallout of 1D&D being. Maybe we'll do an episode on this. So, but, yes, in most cases, one person at the table shoulders the whole of the financial burden. And I think it's also why we tend to see far more splat books with player options as, as the game line progresses. Because if I write a book for Jackals, for example, that has, is player-focused, maybe I get three or four sales per table. If I write an adventure, I get one sale per table. And that... It's, it's rough. Ooh, interesting. I'll have to check that one out, uh, John. Thank you for that. Uh, so, yeah. that's. It'll be interesting to see how the playtest and the VTT not only develops over the next two years, but going forward in the future. I think that there could be a change in the way the majority of us 
maybe not us, but the majority of new players view the hobby. And I think from a lifestyle marketing brand, D&D and WotC are doing something that's very much going to lock people into their ecosystem in the same way Apple does. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying that's been a goal, and I think they found a way to do it. So if we're all at all interested in that, we can do a discussion on behind the screen on that. But we'll go from there. So until tonight, hopefully I'll see some of you guys on our tour game tonight. Padre, Ian, John, Rook, Phantom, always good to chat with all of you. We will see you on Thursday for the start of our Grim Dark Fantasy. Look at uh, the the origin of the the genre. What are the genre tropes, and who's currently writing in there? And we will see you all on Thursday for more behind the screen. Thank you, John Doom for showing up to the show and everyone else. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave some comments below. I, I always try to answer them. I'm not always the quickest on the response, but I do try. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay gaming. I will see you all on Thursday for more behind the screen and hopefully tonight for some more Torg. Until then, have a good one.